the uh, writers that are writing this new prophecy paradigm material, a lot of them are using um, ancient mythology, which we've mentioned before. Um, could you delineate a few of the examples of the ancient myths that they are reinvigorating and actually bringing alive for our last day's era? Well, Tom Horn is one of the number one uh, purveyors of these ideas. Um, and he's gone back to uh, the Osiris Egyptian myth. Mm. Um, and there's a whole issue there with, uh, um, in fact, Nephilim Stargates 2012, The Return of the Watchers. That one was of one, Horn's books. That's one of Horn's books. And if you go through that book, you can't get but a few paragraphs in. And he gives genealogies of different you know, Demeter mm. and Isis and uh, gods and goddesses I've never heard of. And then he goes into a, an elaborate, uh, sordid lifestyles of each of these entities and what they did and who they were related to. And then he has the, the idea that they're real, they're alive, and these are attached to all of these other entities that are coming through these portals, and that's why we have to devise these ways of somehow combating them. Uh, Peter Goodgang, he wrote a book recently, it was published by Tom Horn, called The Second Coming of the Antichrist. And in that book he also postulates that mm -hmm. the god Apollo, another word for him is Apollyon, uh, Osiris, uh, he will be coming again, he'll be reincarnated as the Antichrist. Okay. Um, uh, Doug Hamp, L.A. Marzulli, uh, Steve Quayle, Russ Dizdar, David Flynn, all of these men have books, writings, DVDs, videotapes, all saying essentially the same thing. Now each one of them will embellish and use their imaginations and then tack on some more extra biblical source work uh, to be able to make them even more exciting and interesting. But basically it is Greek and Roman mythology, Sumerian, Akkadian, uh, the list is endless, yep. and yep. It's, it's ongoing, and every, every month there's a new book or new publication with some new insight, some new revelation about these entities, pagan gods and goddesses. Yeah, the ancient Near East uh, was filled with pagan gods and goddesses, as both of you know. And even between civilization, there was a cross-fertilization that took place in other words, the ideas of one civilization would influence the thinking of another civilization. Uh, they would only change the names to protect the innocent, so to speak. But with the name change, it did not alter their concept or view of God, and furthermore, their worldview. This, of course, is the mysticism of the East. It is my considered belief that there are only two ways to approach God. One is by believing in his revelation through the scriptures that he gave to us and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now granted, natural revelation plays some role in this as Paul put it in Romans chapter 1. But either religion begins it's a bad word, I don't like the word religion, because it's man's attempt to reach God. But the idea is that either the search for God begins with a mystical search, or God reveals himself and takes the initiative. The two approaches are polar opposite. The one is works, and the other is grace. Grace, God does the initiation. When we look at these religions of what we would call the ancient Middle East, Isaiah had a phrase, and uh, he called it the influences of the East. Now, these influences came to have some sway in ancient Israel because we know they settled in Canaan, and Canaan was totally given over to this kind of spirituality. I, for one, believe that the whole Bible, with its emphasis upon the revelation of the Word of God is written to counteract all of mysticism. Now what I'm saying is, I'm not suggesting we don't need to have experience because the Holy Spirit gives us 
experience. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bath. But the experience does not come from below. We don't work it up. It comes from above. Mm -hmm. A man must be born from above. Anothen, John chapter 3. So any approach which attempts to place this uh, work of God in the sphere of below is works. And Isaiah the prophet said, For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. Well, why did God, why did the Lord God abandon his people, the house of Jacob? Because they are filled with the influences from the east, and they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. What happened? God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of Babylon, to separate him from that spirituality. In Revelation chapter 17, we know that Babylon is the mother of harlots and abominations on the earth. So if you're looking for a fountainhead for the type of stuff we're talking about, we need go no further than ancient Babylon. Mm -hmm. And we know that that is in the vicinity if, for example, the geology is about the same from before the flood and after the flood. We know it's about the same geographical location as the garden and the temptation of Satan. So we could expect the system of Satan to emanate out of that region of the world. The problem with Israel was is that they then viewed themselves as those who would disobey God and venture into all these influences of the East. Well, what did God do? God sent them back to Babylon, where they came from, where Abraham came from. He said, if you want that kind of religion, then uh, I'll give it to you. You can go back to Babylon. So 586 BC, you know, Nebuchadnezzar invaded and took hordes of Jews, not all of them, but most of them back to Babylon. Now, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 about the time frame of when their captivity was about to be completed after 70 years. The children of Israel were going to leave Babylon. And we know that the Apostle Paul quotes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Isaiah 52, 11. And 52, 11 is the verse that the Lord addresses to those Jews who are leaving Babylon. And so the Apostle Paul says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship have light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, quoting Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 11, Come out from among their midst and be separate, saith the Lord. When you leave Babylon, leave all of that spiritual baggage behind. And furthermore, he adds, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What I find ironic in the whole discussion we've had is that God called upon Abraham to separate himself from the very kind of spirituality that we're talking about hmm. and walk by faith. All of this stuff is not a walk of faith. It's a walk according to evidence phenomena, and so forth. And in my thinking, we have a great Savior in Jesus Christ. He's a wonderful Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. And I think that that's the truth we have to recognize. What a wonderful blessing, a sinner saved by grace. Amen.